Okay, I'm going to start this morning by just welcoming all of you guys. Sawadee Kap, welcome to Wat Tung Yu. Nice to see all of you guys here this morning. Welcome to everyone who's joining us online as well. This is our group learning program where each Sunday and Wednesday I get together with students and share with them the teachings of the Buddha on the path to enlightenment, helping you to understand how to move the mind to this enlightened mental state where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, where you no longer experience any discontent feelings. By the time you get to enlightenment, you no longer experience any anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, loneliness, boredom, stress, anxiety, shyness, resentment, jealousy, all of these feelings and others are completely eliminated from the enlightened mind. And you get to that through training of the mind. It's not a bunch of beliefs that you believe in the teachings of the Buddha and then hope something good happens when you die. Instead, you're learning now in the present moment in your life. Now you're learning and investigating, examining his teachings. You're reflecting on those teachings to independently verify whether they're true or they're false. And then you're practicing his teachings in order to train the mind and uproot certain pollutions that he discovered about the mind. So there's various teachings that you would need on this path to enlightenment. Meditation is one of those, but there's a lot of other teachings that you need as well. I will typically start each one of our classes on Sundays and Wednesdays and all of our other classes, courses and retreats with a meditation. But today I'm not actually going to be starting with meditation because today is the beginning of a four part series where I'm going to be teaching meditation. And then what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start teaching you meditation and then after I teach it to you then we're going to do it together we just restarted our group learning program on Sunday and you can attend here at the temple or you can attend online as well no matter where you are in the world we have ability for you to join by Facebook YouTube or zoom there's even other platforms as well that we live stream to even podcasts and things like this to help you gradually learn the teachings of the Buddha and since we just restarted our program on Sunday from the very beginning here on Wednesday, what I'm going to do on the next four Wednesdays is I'm going to be teaching meditation in order to help students to understand what meditation is and building up their practice. So that's what I'm going to be doing at the first part of our class today. But then by the time we're done, I'm actually going to be guiding you in a breathing mindfulness meditation session. So again, welcome to all of you guys, those of you guys that are here at the temple and those of you guys that are joining online line as well. So as I mentioned, this is part of the group learning program where I meet on Sundays and Wednesdays at 9 a.m. here at the temple. And I also live stream that class. And then I also teach the same class from home at 9 p.m. So no matter where you are in the world, there should be a live class for you. And then it's recorded as well. So in some time zones, it might actually be Tuesday evening right now, but it's Wednesday morning for us here. And then when I teach on, at Wednesday evening Thai time for some time zones, that might be Wednesday morning or Wednesday afternoon. So uh, you can join this program either here at the temple in the morning or online and you can also join online in the evening because I teach from my home studio. So to start you off understanding and learning breathing mindfulness meditation, which is a primary form of training that the Buddha taught, I'm going to share a few of the words from the Buddha about meditation because I'm not interested in students ever believing any of the teachings of the Buddha and the Buddha wasn't interested in that either. You'll never see anywhere in his teachings where he says, just believe me because with belief, you don't know what's true or false. What you're doing on this path to enlightenment is you're working to get toward wisdom where you can acquire wisdom to know the truth about the natural laws of existence around you. The Buddha didn't teach a bunch of rules and commandments. And if everybody follows these rules and commandments and the world will become a peaceful place, that's not actually what he did. He didn't teach you the way the world should be. He's teaching you the way the world is. And by understanding the way the world is, your mind will be able to awaken to this wisdom and move closer and closer to this enlightened mental state. And one of the things that he teaches is meditation in order to train your mind to help you build the qualities that you need in order to move your mind to this enlightened mental state. So here I'm going to share a few words of the Buddha on meditation. Of course, he has very extensive teachings on meditation. And in this book series that I share, which is titled The Words of the Buddha, The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden. It's a 13 book book series. There's one book devoted just to meditation. It's the Breathing Mindfulness Meditation book. It's volume seven of the book series where you can see a consolidated version of the teachings of the Buddha around breathing mindfulness meditation. So he has extensive teachings about meditation 
information and guidance of how to actually meditate. But here I'm just going to share a few of his words with you on meditation so that you understand this as I move into sharing with you how to meditate, why you would meditate and all these other details. Because I'm not interested in you even believing that the Buddha actually taught meditation. It's not important for you to believe anything at all. Don't believe what I say. Don't believe what I write in books. Learn it, examine it, investigate it, reflect on it to independently verify whether it's true or false, and then practice it and see the truth for yourself that your mind moves closer and closer to this peaceful and joyful mental state. So here, this first phrase that the Buddha is sharing is he says, meditate monks, or you might think of that as meditate students, do not be complacent lest you regret it later. This is my instruction to you. So here the Buddha is encouraging his students to meditate because you'll regret it later when you're angry, you're sad, you're feeling resentfulness, when you're jealous, when you're envious and all these other discontent feelings, you're going to regret having not meditated. When you're laying awake at night and your mind is just ruminating and kind of obsessively thinking about one thing or the other and you have difficulties falling asleep at night and you wake up in the morning feeling grumpy and irritable, you'll regret having not meditated. So this is the only thing you'll ever get from the Buddha, the closest thing you'll ever get where he's kind of like, okay, come on, you know, let's, let's go meditate. You know, you should meditate. He never tries to coerce you or force you or convince you of anything. He's not trying to convince you of what you should or shouldn't do. He's just sharing with you what he did in order to get to enlightenment. And in order to get to enlightenment, you're going to need an ongoing, consistent, well-developed meditation practice. You're going to need to be determined, dedicated, and diligent. You can't be complacent. Complacency would be to be dull or lethargic or uh, unmotivated, lacking initiative. So in order to get to enlightenment, you're going to need to have a dedicated and diligent meditation practice and not be complacent. If you are complacent in your meditation practice, or if you've ever been there, which perhaps all of us have at one point or another, you can eradicate that. You can arise the energy, the motivation, the enthusiasm to build up a meditation practice. And I'm going to teach you how to do that because complacency isn't going to help you. You need to eradicate this. This is one of the hindrances to enlightenment, that it will hinder you from being able to get to enlightenment because if you're complacent <clears throat> you're not going to be interested perhaps in coming to the temple to learn you're not going to perhaps pick up a book and read you're not going to maybe meditate you're not going to apply your effort and energy to developing your life practice so you're going to need to arise this energy and effort in the mind to apply dedication and diligence to develop your practice this next one he says a pot without a stand is easy to tip over here he's saying a pot without a stand is easy to tip over. The pot is your mind. The stand is your meditation practice. A mind without a meditation practice is easy to become discontent. That's what he's saying. It's easy for your mind to become shaken up and fall apart if you don't have a solid meditation practice. You need a solid stand. So a pot without a stand is easy to tip over. A mind without a meditation practice is easy to become angry and frustrated and agitated and annoyed and all these other discontent feelings that the mind is experiencing. So as you build up your meditation practice, it's like building this wider and wider stand. Right now, maybe you just have like a little dowel rod and your pot is kind of teetering on that Tao rod. But as you develop your meditation practice more and more, this stand becomes wider and wider and wider and it's harder and harder to tip over the mind. By the time you get to enlightenment, your mind is unshakable. There's nothing that'll shake up your mind. Even if you experience the death of somebody close to you, your mind won't be shaken up by that. Right now, you might think that it's your love that's causing you to experience grief or misery or despair or sorrow when somebody dies as close to you or your care, but it's not your sorrow. I'm sorry. It's not your love or your care that's causing the sorrow. It's actually the, what's called craving desire attachment. It's the mind craving for this individual to be permanent. That love is a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well. What's causing the mind to experience these discontent feelings is not something external. What's causing the mind to experience the anger and frustration and all these other discontent feelings is internal inside the mind. There are certain pollutions that the Buddha discovered, and you can understand what these pollutions are, learn about them, reflect on them, independently verify them, and then practice to uproot these pollutions out of the mind. And that's why you experience more peace and joy in this lifetime as you're eradicating these pollutions. It's not something external. 
external that's causing these discontent feelings and that's why you can eliminate them because it's your own mind that's actually causing these so this pot can become very stable when it has a nice strong stand or your mind can become very stable when you have a nice strong meditation practice that's well developed this next one he's talking about the importance of meditation he's saying monks there is one thing that when developed and cultivated leads exclusively to liberation to freedom from strong feelings to elimination to peace to direct knowledge or experience to enlightenment to nibbana what is that one thing mindfulness of breathing or breathing mindfulness meditation this is that one thing that when developed and cultivated leads exclusively to liberation to freedom from strong feelings to elimination to peace to direct knowledge experience to enlightenment to nibbana so here he's saying that meditation this breathing mindfulness meditation it leads to enlightenment that's the purpose of this breathing mindfulness meditation he's not saying you only need one thing in order to get to enlightenment or otherwise he would have just taught meditation and that's it but he taught from the age of 35 to the age of 80 for 45 years and he taught various teachings that you need to understand in order to get to enlightenment one of the biggest myths about the life story of the buddha is people think that he sat under a tree he meditated and then he instantly got to enlightenment so a lot of times you'll see people put a lot of emphasis on meditation well meditation is important and you're going to need meditation that's why we teach it but it's not the only thing that you actually need so here he's not saying that breathing mindfulness meditation is the only thing you need or else that's all he would have ever taught what he's saying is this meditation it leads to one goal or one objective which is enlightenment this peaceful mental state it's kind of like saying you're car it leads to one thing which is transportation right that's the one thing that your car leads to is transportation right there's one thing that this meditation leads to which is enlightenment that would be the purpose of practicing this form of meditation is to move the mind to enlightenment but there's other things you need as well in order to get to enlightenment Let's talk about some meditation basics first as we move into talking about meditation and helping you understand it, just to kind of establish a few basic things. First, let's just talk about a definition of meditation. Because of impermanence and things are very different all throughout the world, the universal truth of impermanence is a core central teaching of the Buddha. Not everybody thinks the same way about meditation. So I'm gonna share with you how I think about meditation. Whether you think about meditation in this way or not is up to you, but at least when I say the word meditation, you'll understand what it is that I'm talking about okay so here I'm sharing meditation is a technique to actively train the mind during dedicated independent purposeful training sessions to eliminate unwholesome qualities of the mind and or cultivate wholesome qualities of the mind in the positions of seated lying standing or walking so it's a dedicated, active, purposeful training session where you're eliminating certain unwholesome qualities and you're cultivating certain wholesome qualities. So for each meditation that the Buddha teaches and that I share with you, I'm going to show you in a moment what the unwholesome qualities are that you're eliminating and the wholesome qualities that you're cultivating because you need to know this. This is the why behind meditation. So you'll need to understand that because you're uprooting these certain pollutions out of the mind, but you're also developing certain wholesome qualities qualities during meditation that you're going to need in your day-to-day -day life. It's also important to understand what meditation isn't. This is a way to help you understand what meditation is, is to understand what meditation isn't. Meditation isn't walking the dog. It's not driving a car. It's not exercising. It's not gardening or any of these other activities. Sometimes nowadays someone might say, oh, I'm going to go for a drive and meditate, or I'm going to go walk the dog and meditate, or I'm going to go do some gardening and meditate. This isn't actually meditation in the way that the Buddha taught. And if somebody thought that this was meditation, when in a moment you hear me talk about meditating two or three times a day, and if you went and gardened two or three times a day thinking that that was meditation, you wouldn't actually be able to get to enlightenment by gardening two or three times a day. That's not what's going to produce your enlightenment. While these things could be very beneficial, exercising, walking the dog perhaps, going for a nice drive, gardening, doing other activities, these can be very wonderful for you in life. It's just important to understand that 
that this isn't meditation in the way that the Buddha taught. So in the world, you'll see various people talk about various things, whether it's meditation or any other thing, <clears throat> and they may not be using those words in the same way that the Buddha did. So if you're using words in the same way that the Buddha did, you'll be able to then understand what it takes for you to move to this enlightened mental state. Whereas if you're confused or having misunderstanding about what it is that the Buddha taught, you'll find it more and more difficult, more challenging to move your mind to enlightenment because you're not understanding what the Buddha taught in terms of meditation. So meditation is this dedicated, active, purposeful training session where you're eliminating certain unwholesome qualities and you're cultivating certain wholesome qualities. And you would be doing that in the seated, lying, standing, or walking positions. These are four specific positions and I'm going to share with you how to use these different positions and why you would need them. Then when you're developing your meditation practice, it's important to have a teacher. Nowadays, we have a lot of self-service things, which is wonderful, like YouTube and Facebook and podcasts and books and things like this. But if you were out there trying to learn through YouTube and books and podcasts all by yourself and that was it, you actually wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment. The Buddha could get to enlightenment by himself, but there are certain qualities in an individual's mind who is going to become a Buddha that makes it possible for them to get to enlightenment by themselves. But a Buddha in the world is very rare. The last one that it, the world knows about existed over 2,500 years ago. And in order to get to enlightenment, you would need a teacher or and guides to be able to help you get to enlightenment. You wouldn't be able to just go off in the forest on your own and get to enlightenment because your mind doesn't have the same capability as an individual who's going to become a Buddha. There's individuals who have tried to go off on their own, not realizing that they can't get to enlightenment by themselves. And they've run into all kinds of difficulties. And sometimes those people end up contacting me. There's one particular story that I can tell you about to help illustrate this point is that there was one time this doctor several years ago who was out looking at YouTube videos and books and things like this. They were doing this for about two years. And they got to a point where they became very suicidal. They were sleeping 23 day, or twenty-three hours a day. Uh, their relationships were falling apart. They weren't able to go to work anymore um, because their life was falling apart. Their mind had deteriorated over this two-year period because they were trying to mix and match things on YouTube and books and different things. They didn't have a teacher to be able to help guide them and help them understand what they needed to do in order to move their mind to enlightenment. So after this two-year period, for one reason or another, they reached out to me they found me on online I guess and they reached out to me and they let me know what was going on <clears throat> they ended up learning with me for several months in their home country uh, because I have live stream and books and things that they could reach out they have they could meet with me privately in zoom and things like this <clears throat> eventually they ended up coming to Thailand and they spent a little bit of time here and then they went back to their home country over time, they eventually worked themselves out of that situation where they were no longer suicidal. They were able to go back to work. Their relationships improved, even though they lost one of their relationships. They had a fiance that this individual, he had lost his relationship with her. And there were some other challenges that he experienced over the four to six year time frame. But nonetheless, he was able to work his mind out of that situation once he started getting the help that he needed. I don't suspect that you'll experience this at all because you'll have a teacher, perhaps, if you heed the advice here, that it's important that you have someone you can reach out to. Whether it's me or somebody else, it's important for you to have somebody that you can reach out to. Not that you need to talk to that person every day or every week or every month, but as you're experiencing various things in your meditation practice, you would like to have somebody you can reach out to and say, hey, I'm experiencing this. Uh, you know, Is this normal? And if what you get back from your teacher is, yes, that's normal, keep going, that can give you some reassurance. It can give you some confidence. Whereas if you're out there on your own and you're not knowing what you're doing, it's kind of like walking through the forest, a dark forest without a flashlight. If you were walking out in the forest in a dark forest without a flashlight, you're going to trip and fall. You're going to hurt yourself. So you need a light. And the teacher is the one who's holding the light and helping you to be able to see where this path leads and how to traverse this path. So I would encourage you to be sure that you have somebody that you can reach out to as a teacher to help you develop your meditation practice. 
And then in terms of meditation basics, let's talk a little bit about the four positions and how you might use them. There's the seated, lying, standing, and walking positions. These four positions are used at different times for different reasons because your body can't permanently be in the same exact position all the time. It's not possible. You're going to have situations where you need these different positions. Like for example, one time I got in a motorbike accident several years ago. I wasn't able to sit. I wasn't able to cross my legs. I was laying in a hospital bed with an eye IV hooked up to me, right? So I needed for a period of time to do the lying position in order to continue to train the mind. So you're going to need these different positions at different times. I'm going to share with you how I use these positions and in what situations I use them in. But then it's important that you don't believe me and you don't just follow what I'm doing. Instead, you're your own independent practitioner. You can use my guidance as help and guide, but you need to figure out what works best for you. So I'm going to share with you how I use these different positions but then you practice in order to figure out how these positions work best for you. So the seated position is a position that is oftentimes used as a primary position for students to learn and develop their practice in meditation. Oftentimes students are learning sitting on the floor or sitting in a chair or in some kind of seated, seated position. And this is kind of like a go-to position for students because it's really accessible, it's easy, and it's something that students will oftentimes learn in. And then it might even be your primary form of meditation in terms of a position. But in the seated position, you might notice at certain times you have aches and pains in the body. Maybe your hips hurting, your knees hurting, maybe your back's hurting. In these situations, it would be unwise to just sit there in the pain because as you're trying to eliminate certain unwholesome qualities from the mind and cultivate certain wholesome qualities, if your mind is just experiencing pain, 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 it's going to be very challenging for you to eliminate certain unwholesome qualities and cultivate certain wholesome qualities. So here, the seated position, you might need to change over to a lying position where you're lying on your back, face up. Some people in yoga might call this resting pose. I think it's called corpse pose or shavasana pose. These are some of the different names for it, where you're just lying on your back, face up with your hands out to the side. And this way, you're all your muscles in the body are completely relaxed. So this can be really helpful for you if you're noticing pain in the body because at no time should you ever just breathe through the pain. If you can adjust in your position of seated and get to a comfortable position, wonderful. But if not, you might need to just lie down and this will take away all the tension in the muscles and allow the body to completely relax. But in the seated position, in the lying position, you might notice that you're having difficulties falling asleep. If you notice that you're dozing off and you're falling asleep regularly, you kind of have two options. You could change position to like a standing position. Standing, you just stand up on your two feet with your hands and arms either in front of you or on the side or behind you. Or the second thing you could do is just go to sleep, right? Maybe you're three minutes, five minutes into your meditation, you're dozing off and your mind is maybe starting to function more optimally. Maybe your mind has a tendency to sleep more now. You'll notice this as you start meditating, you'll get better quality of sleep. And as you're noticing that, maybe you just need to get some sleep because you haven't been sleeping very well. So you could either change your position to extend your meditation session, or you could just get some sleep. And then when you wake up, then you could start meditation again. So standing position is really helpful for that. You can even use standing position at different situations. Like I've been at bus stops before where I'm waiting for a bus and I know it's not coming for 15, 20 minutes and I'm standing up, there's nowhere to sit. You can be doing some meditation. I've been in lines before, maybe like at a government office waiting for my driver's license or something. And I knew that this line was only moving like every 10 minutes or every 20 minutes. And I'm just standing in line. I could get a little bit of meditation in there. I could do a little touch up of meditation. So you could use it for that situation as well. And then there's walking position. Walking position is really good if the mind's sleepy, because if you're walking, you tend to not fall asleep when you're walking. Although I have had some students that say they get sleepy in walking meditation too, but it's less rare. Um, it, it's less possible for you to get sleepy while you're walking. So if you're sleepy in the seated or lying position, you could switch to a walking, but also walking is really good if you have an overactive mind, if you have an anxious mind, if you have a lot of energy in your mind, and the last thing you're thinking about is sitting still somewhere, and it's just like, no way, my mind can't do that right now. 
walking position would be really good for you. So you can use these positions as just one position during a meditation session, like just do walking or just do seated or just do lying or something like this. But you could also interchange these positions. If you came and you sat down and you were starting to sit in your meditation and three minutes, five minutes in, you realize how busy your mind is and there's just no way you could sit there and meditate, you could switch to a walking position. And now you do walking for 15, 20, 30 minutes, whatever it is. And that could be done right there. Or if you'd like to go back to seated, you could go back to seated. Um, or you could start with walking and then move to a lying or a standing or something like this. So you don't need to just strike a pose and then just stick with that all the way through your meditation. You can actually adjust your body positioning in your meditation. So these are interchangeable. And these are the different ways that I've used these but again, don't believe what I'm doing. Don't just follow what I'm doing. You need to be able to see the truth for yourself. So use these in different ways and see what, in what different types of situations they work best for you. So these are some of the basics on meditation. Okay. Now these are the four types of meditation that the Buddha taught. He taught breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation. He taught a meditation to eliminate sexual cravings. And he taught a meditation to help you realize non-self, which you may not understand what that is right now, but that's okay. That's something that you'll learn at another time. So here, the primary form of meditation that the Buddha taught is breathing mindfulness meditation. This is going to help you eliminate what's called craving desire attachment. This is an unwholesome quality in the mind that the Buddha discovered. This is the cause of what's causing the mind to experience discontent feelings. So all that anger and sadness, frustration, and all those other discontent feelings that I mentioned, that's what's causing it. And I'm going to be teaching this on Sunday in this group learning program here at the temple and online. You'll be able to learn the core cause of what's causing your mind to experience these discontent feelings because you wouldn't be able to eliminate them if you didn't understand what was causing them. So I'm going to teach this on Sunday and I have it in books and I have audiobooks, podcasts, other classes where I've taught this, but I'm also going to be teaching it as part of this group learning program on Sunday because it's the very first most foundational teaching of the Buddha. If you didn't understand this very first teaching of his, you wouldn't be able to make any other progress on the path to enlightenment. So that's why I start off the program with that particular teaching. So you're going to learn about what craving desire attachment is there, but this is the quality that you're eliminating with breathing mindfulness meditation and you're cultivating mindfulness or awareness of mind and you're cultivating concentration because as you guys are going to see in a moment that we're going to focus on the breath and when you're focused on the breath you're developing awareness of your mind and being aware of what's going on in the mind because if you're going to purify your mind of these pollutions that the buddha discovered you need to be aware of what's going on in your mind and in the unenlightened state we tend to not be aware we tend to just be kind of going through life making self-pleasing decisions in the unenlightened state kind of basing our decisions and our own selfish desires not really thinking about other people or how our decisions might impact other people so in order for you to purify your mind you're going to need this mindfulness or awareness of mind so by focusing on the breath you can develop this awareness of the mind you're also developing concentration or singleness of mind being able to focus on a single object and what you guys are going to see is when the mind moves off the breath during your meditation you cut that off let it go and you bring the mind back to the breath so when you're doing this about 20 30 maybe 50 times during your meditation you're going to notice your mind's moving off your breath and you're going to need to bring it back and bring it back and bring it back and bring it back and each time you're bringing your mind back you're training the mind to let go this is what's causing the mind to experience these discontent feelings is the craving, desire, attachment, the clinging, the holding on. The unenlightened mind doesn't know how to let go. It hasn't been trained to let go. So what you're doing in this meditation is you're training your mind to let go. And you're also training to develop that mindfulness or awareness of mind and concentration so that now in daily life with your mindfulness or your awareness of mind, where you see the anger starting to arise, when you see the frustration starting to arise, you can see that with your mindfulness if you develop your mindfulness and meditation and you can cut it off and let it go. Where if you didn't have those qualities developed in your mind, you wouldn't be able to do that. You wouldn't be able to see the anger that it was starting to arise and you wouldn't be able to let it go. So by the time you get to enlightenment, you'll be able to let this go. You're not suppressing your feelings, 
by training your mind to enlightenment. You're actually eliminating the causes and conditions that are producing these discontent feelings, namely craving, desire, attachment. This is what's causing those discontent feelings and you can eliminate it by learning how to restrain the mind and discipline the mind and control the mind. So this is what we're gonna be doing today. After we do our four part series in this group learning program of breathing mindfulness meditation, I'm then going to be moving into a four part series on loving kindness meditation, teaching that. So I'm going to reserve this and all the other meditations for later in the program, because there's a point in time where I teach loving kindness meditation. I will teach the meditation to eliminate sexual cravings. If somebody needs that, not everybody needs that one. And then the meditation to realize non-self. Every practitioner who's interested in getting to enlightenment using the teachings of the Buddha, they would need breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation. But these other two, not everybody's going to necessarily need those. But the first two, everybody's going to need those because it relates to two of the primary problems that the Buddha discovered. He discovered three primary problems. It's called craving, anger, and ignorance or unknowing of true reality. These are called the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots. And breathing mindfulness meditation addresses the first one. Loving kindness meditation addresses the second one. And then the third one, you cultivate wisdom in order to antidote that or uproot that out of the mind. So we're going to focus on breathing mindfulness meditation today. So let's talk, talk about starting and conducting a meditation session. These are some pointers to be able to help you get started. The first thing to understand is that the mind is the boss and the body is the employee. The mind is the boss and the body is the employee. So essentially the body is just following whatever's going on in the mind. And whenever you're trying to go see the boss, you usually need to go through the employees to be able to get to the boss. Well, if the employee is feeling pain, if they're upset, if they're angry, they're probably not going to take you to go see the boss. But also if they're too luxurious, they're going to be complacent and they're not going to take you to go see the boss. So with the body, you would like the body to be in the middle where the body's comfortable. Because if the body was painful, it's not going to take you to go see the boss. But if it was too luxurious, it's not going to take you to go see the boss either. It's going to be dull or lethargic or complacent. So you'd like the body to be in the middle where it's comfortable. So no matter what position you take, you would like to find some comfort, not luxurious and not painful, because that way the body being comfortable, it'll take you to go see the boss. If all you notice in the body is pain, 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 it's not going to take you to go see the boss. You can't get to the mind. So be sure that you put your body in a comfortable position and that's the middle way that'll take you to go see the boss. If you read the teachings of the Buddha about meditation and you see his instructions line by line about what he talks about with meditation, at the beginning when he starts guiding his students, he talks about setting up mindfulness in front of you before you start meditating. This is a regular phrase that you will see with the Buddha where he says, set up mindfulness in front of you before you start meditating. What mindfulness is, is awareness of mind. You're going to understand more about mindfulness when we talk about the Eightfold Path. I have a three-part series over the next three Sundays where we're going to dive deep into the Eightfold Path. And on the third Sunday, we're going to go into right mindfulness and talk about not only awareness of mind, but something called the four foundations of mindfulness. This is how you fully understand what mindfulness is, is by learning what the four foundations of mindfulness are. But when you first get started, you usually think about mindfulness as just awareness of mind. And this is helpful for you to understand because like I mentioned in the world, you hear different people use these words in different ways where someone might say, can you mindfully carry this glass of water to that table over there? This isn't actually how the Buddha used the word mindfulness. What they're really saying is, can you carefully carry this glass of water to that table? So not everybody studies with the original words of the Buddha. So not everybody's going to use that word in the same exact way. Otherwise that would be permanence. The way the Buddha used the word mindfulness is awareness of mind that you need to have awareness of mind. So even though other people might be using the word mindfulness as careful, it's important that you understand what it is and you use it in terms of the way the Buddha used it because that way you understand what he's teaching you and this will help you to develop your mind. So this mindfulness, awareness of mind, when he's talking about setting up mindfulness in front of you before you meditate, what he's talking about is bring some awareness of your mind into the mind 
before you start meditating. In other words, don't just plop down and start meditating because it's going to be five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes before you start getting any benefit out of that meditation because you don't yet have awareness of the mind. But if you develop mindfulness and you set up mindfulness in front of you, if you set up this awareness of mind in front of you before you start meditating, this will actually help you to get more benefit out of the meditation. And I do something called chanting prior to meditating in order to help me set up mindfulness in front of me. And I'm going to explain that to you here in a moment a little bit. And then in about, what, two months from now, I'm going to do a four-part series on chanting so students can understand how to do chanting and develop their chanting practice as part of this uh, group learning program. So the Buddha teaches to set up mindfulness in front of you. And this is something that you do prior to meditating for each meditation. And then in terms of time, frequency, and schedule, this is how you would maybe consider setting up your time or your frequency or some type of schedule in meditation. In terms of time, what you'll notice is when you get to 30 minutes per session or more, this is going to produce the most benefits for you. But you're probably not going to start with just 30 minutes per session. You might start with five minutes or 10 minutes or even one minute. I know when I first started meditating, my mind was so bombarded with thoughts, I could barely do one minute or two minutes or three minutes of meditation. So everybody starts at a different place with their meditation. And the amount of time that you would like to ultimately build up to is 30 minutes or more. And this is where you'll notice the most benefits. In terms of frequency, you'd like to develop two or three sessions per day. That's what you'd like to build up to. And again, not everybody's going to start there. Very rarely does somebody start with two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. But instead, you start wherever you start. If you start with one session for five minutes, excellent start there or if you start with two sessions for 10 minutes great start there that's where you need to start what you'll notice is frequency is more important than duration so if it's a matter of one session for 30 minutes or two for 15 minutes I would suggest that you go for the two for 15 minutes and then gradually expand from there and that's where you'll see the most benefits in terms of a schedule for meditation, you're not going to be able to meditate at exactly the same time every day. It's not possible because of the universal truth of impermanence. You can understand that it's not possible for you to meditate at 8 a.m. every single day. It's just not possible. I've been meditating before in my room, thinking that I was at home alone meditating. And my son walks in and says, hey, dad, I need you to take me to school. I'm like, huh? I thought your mom was going to take you to school. He's like, yeah, me too. And uh, she's gone. She's not here. I need you to take me to school. I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'm taking you to school, right? So after three minutes of meditating, I had to get up and go take him to school. And then when I came back, I, I was able to meditate and, and develop my practice after I got back from taking him to school. But if my mind was fixed to this time that you had to meditate every day at exactly the same time, when those kinds of things occur, you would be frustrated, you'd be agitated, you'd be annoyed. But if you understand that all these things are impermanent and you can't meditate at exactly the same time, you can get up and go take your child to school or go do something else or whatever it is that you need to do and you're not trying to meditate at exactly the same time. So if you heard from somebody that you needed to meditate at exactly the same time every day, like like maybe 3.30 a.m., like there's maybe something special going on in the world at 3.30 a.m. and you've got to meditate at exactly this time every day, it's not possible for you to meditate at exactly 3.30 a.m. There's nothing special about 3.30 a.m. that's going to make your meditation better or worse you meditate whenever you'd like to meditate. The Buddha meditated three times a day. He meditated morning, midday, and evening. You can see it in his teachings. He talks about it, right? And during the lifetime of the Buddha 2,500 years ago, they couldn't keep precise time. They didn't have a watch. They didn't have a mobile phone, right? They didn't have a computer that was hooked up to a satellite somewhere that synced up the time, right? They weren't able to do that. So if the Buddha was able to meditate at different times during the day, he didn't meditate at exactly the same time every day, and he got to enlightenment, 
that means you can do the same thing. So he had these anchor points where morning, midday, and evening, he would meditate at some point because he knew that he couldn't meditate at exactly the same time. And he didn't even have the ability to tell that it was exactly the same time because there was no watches or timepieces or anything like that during his lifetime. So he didn't meditate at exactly the same time and neither will you, you won't be able to. So if you have anchor points in your life, like morning and evening, and that's what you're working to build up your practice. And then occasionally if you can get a midday session in, wonderful. You'll build up your practice to two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. Sometimes it takes students six months, a year, even two years to build up to this type of frequency and duration. So be patient with yourself. Don't put expectations on yourself and then just gradually build up your practice to that point. As I mentioned, you might notice sleepiness during meditation. This is very common, particularly when you first get started, because as you first get started with meditation, that's the most polluted the mind will ever be. And now as you start training your mind, this pollution will start to get uplifted out of the mind. And as you're doing that, it takes a certain amount of work, a certain amount of effort and energy to train your mind. And you can get really sleepy from that. But also, as you're starting to uplift that pollution out of your mind, it's going to start functioning more optimally, and therefore your mind might have more of a tendency to fall asleep. So you might notice this kind of period of time of three months, six months, where you get really sleepy during meditation as you first start developing your practice, and eventually you'll get over that hump, and you'll see that you won't experience that any longer. But as you first get started, if you notice that, again, you have those two options. You could either switch your position to either standing or walking, and that'll help you extend your meditation session, or you could just get some sleep. Just go to sleep. When you wake up, you can meditate when you wake up. Allow the mind to get the rest that it needs. You might notice physical sensations during your meditation, like itches and things like this. Uh, if you notice these kinds of things, what I suggest you do is, is try to go as long as possible without itching it because this itch is going to arise, it's going to change, and it's going to fade away. This itch is impermanent, but the mind is going to think, oh, I just got an itch. I just got an itch. And if you do that, you're going to notice that you're going to be itching all over the place, right? Because when you, as soon as you take care of this itch, another one's going to spring up somewhere else. It's only a matter of time. So if when you're in meditation, if you can be focusing on the breath and you notice the itch arise, okay, just try to keep focused on the breath. This is really good training for you to just stay focused on the breath. But after five seconds or so, if you're just like, oh, I just got to itch. Okay, go ahead and itch it. But now next time, try to expand that. Try to make it eight seconds or 10 seconds that you don't itch, right? And then make it 12 seconds or 15 seconds. Eventually, you can get to the point where you don't itch at all. And you can just notice the arising, the changing, and the fading away of this. You might even notice certain insects that are coming around to help you and assist you in your meditation. I've had, you know, flies crawling around on my head or going into my ear, or going up my nose and things like this. And this can be really good and really helpful for you that as you're focused on the breath, these little insects are crawling around. I even had one come right to the tip of my nose one time. And this can be really helpful to see, can you stay concentrated even when these things are going on? So if you can stay concentrated with a little itch, when these insects come to help you in your meditation and challenge your mind, you won't necessarily be able to, you know, go through that. So what you would like to do is kind of challenge the mind a little bit as you're starting to develop your practice. So when you notice these physical sensations, try to just keep your mind focused on the breath and this will be really good training for the mind. Then you might notice vi visual stimulation during your meditation. What this is, is like if you've ever been in meditation and you've noticed like white colors or purple or green, or you might have noticed visual stimulation, like different uh, vivid memories or imagery during your meditation. If this is occurring, it's completely normal. Uh, you're not special. You don't have to go find out what these things are. You don't have to go find somebody like, oh, I saw the color green. Does that mean I'm going to get rich? Or I saw the color purple. Does that mean my boyfriend's coming back to me or my girlfriend's coming back to me? Like, what does the color purple mean? You don't need to do any of that because I'm going to share with you what this is actually doing and why this is occurring. When you're training your mind, there's an effect to the brain. The brain and the mind are two different things. These aren't the same things. The brain is the physical organ that's in the body. But the mind is this intangible, this non-physical thing. These things are connected, but they're completely separate. And when you're training the mind, 
there's an effect to the brain. The physical structures of the brain are changing. There's scientists that research this. There's doctors that, that research this. Nowadays, we have MRIs and CAT scans that can measure the changes to the brain for someone who meditates versus someone who doesn't meditate. And they're seeing significant improvement to the condition of the brain based on someone who's training their mind. So as you're training your mind and there's these physical structures of the brain changing, you can see different colors or different vivid imagery during your meditation because the eyeball itself, it's just bringing in light. The sight is actually occurring inside the brain. So even with your eyes closed, you can still see because the sight is actually happening inside the brain. So with the eyes closed and you training your mind and the physical structures of the brain changing, you might see different colors or other vivid imagery. I even heard the physical structures of the brain changing at different times when I was meditating. As I first started before I was even on the path to enlightenment, I used to have all this pressure in my head. I, I felt a lot of pressure in the skull. I used to get migraine headaches maybe three to five times a week even so severe sometimes that I would vomit, they were so significant that as you train your mind and the physical structures of the brain are changing, you might notice that there's less and less pressure in the skull and you might notice that you don't get headaches very frequently. Uh, you might, when there's a little bit of pollution or something like that, that you don't have 100% ability to control the pollution, that you might notice you'll get a headache every once in a while, but you won't get stress headaches, you won't get anxiety headaches and things like this that occur when the mind is untrained. The more and more that you train the mind, it's going to affect the condition of the brain. And now with that changing, your brain is gonna function more optimally. So that's what's happening with this visual stimulation is that the brain's changing, those physical structures are changing and you might actually see different colors or other vivid imagery. And it's not something that you need to go out and try to figure out if one thing's gonna happen or another thing's gonna happen because that's not what meditation is about. It's not about like, oh, I saw this color green, so what does that mean? Well, it just means that the physical structures of the brain are changing, that's all that's occurring. And then lastly, you might have been meditating or you might have heard of people meditating with what I refer to as external stimulus. What this would be would be like music or candles or incense or uh, beads or uh, some special scent in the room or something like this. And if you've been taught to meditate that way and that's what you've been doing up to this point, that's fine. That's where you're at in your practice. But what I would encourage you to do is to let all those things go. Because if your mind gets used to meditating with these different things, your mind just going to be holding on to it. And now you can only meditate if you have those special beads or you have that special incense or that special candle. So when you're three days in the mountains of Chiang Mai in this remote village, you know, really far and distant from civilization and you'd like to meditate, you can't meditate because you don't have your special candle with you or you don't have your special phone app or your special uh, gong or music or some other thing. Instead, what I would suggest that you do is you build your meditation practice around three things because you only need three things to actually meditate. The body, the mind, and the breath. Those are the only three things that you actually need to meditate. The body, the mind, and the breath. And you're gonna have all three of these things with you throughout your life until you take your very last breath. You're gonna have these three things. So when I ended up in the hospital in the motorbike accident, you know, I called my family and said, hey, I'm at the hospital. And my wife's like, oh, okay, I just picked up our son. You know, there's a lot of traffic today. What would you like us to do? And I said, uh, just go home. You know, I don't need you to come to the hospital. I got clothes, I got food, I got water, I got medicine, I got doctors and nurses taking care of me. You guys just go home and relax. They're like, all right, you don't need anything? Nope, I don't need anything. I had body, mind, and breath. I could meditate, right? So you don't need anything. You can strip away all these different things. And that way, when you're in the remote uh, mountains of Chiang Mai, maybe hiking on a five-day, 10-day tour, you don't need anything. You can meditate no matter where you are because you have the body, the mind, and the breath. So if you're currently meditating with any of these external things, like I said, that's okay. That's where you're at now. But what I would encourage you to do is gradually strip those away. But the thing about the unenlightened mind is that when you're training your mind and you're making changes at any point in your life, the unenlightened mind doesn't like change. 
it doesn't like impermanence. It craves permanence. So if you're used to meditating with music or candles or beads, and you need to always have these things with you in order to meditate, when you start making changes in your practice, your mind typically doesn't like this and it will kind of revolt on you. So what you'd like to do is whenever you're moving your mind away from certain attachments is you would like to do this slowly and gradually to the point where the mind doesn't even recognize what you're doing. So if you're used to meditating with those special beads every single session, what I would encourage you to do is do one session with them and one session without them. One session with them, one session without them, one session with them, one session without them. And now when you do that for a little while, now you do two sessions without them, one session with them two sessions with them, one session without them, and then gradually expand that. Three, four, five sessions without them, one session with them. Three, four, five sessions with without them, one session with them. And this is how you gradually move your mind away from any particular attachment, that you're doing such incremental, smaller steps that the mind doesn't even realize what you're doing, that it doesn't understand this impermanence, that it's just gradually being moved away from this particular thing. Whereas if you just kind of drew a line in the sand and like, I'm never going to meditate with these beads ever, your mind probably after three, four, five days is going to revolt on you and it's going to be very discontent. So you can gradually move it away this way. And you can do this with other things in your life. If you've ever been a smoker or you've done other things and you're looking to move away from these things, you can gradually move away from them. Whereas if you go cold turkey and you just snap your fingers, the mind will typically not like that very much. So if you gradually move away from things, it'll be helpful. And even when you're implementing wholesome things into your your life. Like say you decided someday that you would like to move to a plant-based food supply. You're going to probably gradually need to do that where you're gradually bringing down the meat maybe if that's what you're choosing to do. And you're gradually bringing up more and more plant-based foods in your life. And this is something that the mind will be able to sustain for a longer period of time. And you'll feel more comfortable when you're doing these kinds of things. So I'm going to pause here and see what questions you guys have before I kind of finish out what I'm going to share with you guys and then move into meditation. If you guys have questions here at the temple, we have microphones in the white bowl there in front of the camera. If you could use the microphone, that way we'll hear you here at the temple and also be able to hear you online as well. There's a gray button on the front. You just press it and the lights come on. You just wait a second or two and you hold it up to your chin and we'll be able to hear you here and we'll be able to hear you online. And for those of you guys online, you guys can ask questions by putting that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. So is there any questions here? Is there any questions online that you guys would like to ask about what I just shared? Yes, ma'am, if you could help yourself to a microphone and then you guys can keep those microphones with you because we have plenty of them. And then as people around you might need one, you can just kind of pass it around and other people can use it as well. the course today Mm -hmm. and my question is uh, about the teacher you say like we need a teacher guided us for the meditation and is it means that our mind also sort of shaped by the teacher you followed because this this person guide you to to do those things Mm -hmm. so there are so many different teachers they may teach you different things and then how how do you know like uh, this teacher is the proper teacher that suitable for you to follow sure so the buddha was asked these types of questions during his lifetime as well and i'll share with you uh, his reply and then i'll add some to that to help you understand what he was sharing was that if somebody's practicing his teachings very closely what you'll see is that their mind is very clear very concentrated and very focused Because when you have pollutions of your mind, your mind is not going to be very clear. It's not going to be very focused. It's what he used to refer to as muddle-minded. So if somebody has a muddled mind, meaning they lack concentration or focus or clarity, means that their mind is, is polluted and they're having difficulties to speak and explain the teachings and explain the why, right? So when you're interacting with a potential teacher, you're not interested in judging that person and looking down on them. Um, But you would like to observe the quality of their mind and how they interact in the world because this is going to help you to be able to see is this somebody who's developed a practice in such a way that I would like to learn from them about how did they accomplish what they accomplished. Whereas if somebody's mind is muddle minded where they're lacking concentration and focus and clarity 
that means their mind is still polluted and they wouldn't be able to guide you to improve the condition of their of your mind because they haven't even done that work for themselves. So it's kind of like if you were going to go learn how to drive a car, you would like to learn how to drive a car from somebody who's got maybe 20 years of driving experience and maybe, you know, three, four, five, ten 10 years of teaching experience. Whereas if you went to learn how to drive a car from someone who's never driven a car, they wouldn't be able to teach you how to drive a car. That would be very unwise. So you would like to look at the quality of somebody's mind to determine whether this is somebody who's trained their own mind very well and they have concentration and focus and therefore whatever they've accomplished in their practice, they'd be able to help you accomplish that same thing. So some additional things there, and I put this in chapter three all the way at the bottom. If you go to volume one, chapter three of my book, I have this section that's called how to determine if a teacher has attained enlightenment or not. There are certain questions that you can ask somebody. You can ask somebody, you know, is it possible to eliminate anger, sadness, frustration, and you can use all these discontent feelings. And if they say no, it's not possible to eliminate those, that means that they still are experiencing those feelings and therefore their mind is not yet enlightened. Because one of the things that the Buddha teaches is he says, for someone who's not enlightened, it would be very difficult for them to ever share his teachings because their mind hasn't accomplished this ultimate goal. So therefore they would find it a real struggle to be able to share his teachings. So you would like to determine whether a teacher is potentially either enlightened or very close to enlightenment because that's the type of person that's going to help you to be able to accomplish that same mental state. So asking questions like, is it possible to eliminate anger, sadness, frustration, annoyment, disappointment, stress, anxiety, and these kinds of things. If a teacher says, yeah, it's absolutely possible. You can even ask them, when's the last time you experienced anger, sadness, frustration, and all these other discontent feelings? Because that'll give you an indication of you know, how close their mind is to enlightenment. You can ask them, is it possible to eliminate the ego? The ego is like the arrogance, the boastfulness, the pride, the measuring and comparing and judging other people. And if they say, no, it's not possible to eliminate the ego, that means they still have ego themselves and that they haven't eliminated it. So you know that they're not enlightened. Or you could ask them, you know, what types of students do you accept and what types of students do you reject? Because if they're enlightened, they would accept any students. Whereas if they're rejecting certain students, then you know that their mind is not yet enlightened. And then you can even ask them, like, how much does it cost to get to enlightenment? Well, if they whip out a menu and it's like, well, if you'd like to get to enlightenment in one year, it's going to be this amount of money. But if you'd like to get the really fast express way, it's only three months. It's this higher price. You know, here's my menu of services kind of thing. This is a good indication that someone hasn't gotten to enlightenment because by the time someone gets to enlightenment, they're going to have such amount of loving kindness and compassion for all beings. In my opinion, they would share teachings teachings in a way that doesn't uh, cost any money, that they would do it at no cost. Because these teachings to be able to get to enlightenment, they're going to help all beings. But the people who are struggling with financial resources, those are the ones who are struggling the most in the world. And as soon as you put a price tag on your teachings, that means you're blocking out those people from ever being able to access your teachings. And that's not showing loving kindness and compassion. That instead, a teacher who's truly sharing the true teachings should be able to set up in such a way that they're just open to any kind of support that their students would like to provide them, maybe like donations of time, effort, energy, and financial support. And if they're sharing the true teachings, those true teachings would be helping their students and their students would be able to see that it's helping and improve the condition of their mind. And then those students on their own would be willing to support that teacher because they could see that, wow, these teachings are really helpful to me. So I'll help this teacher to be able to share them with other people. So if you see like a menu of services and, you know, price tag associated with any particular aspect of their teachings, then you know that this person has most likely not attained enlightenment and it would be unwise for you to potentially study with that person. So these are some of the things that you can look at to be able to help you decide whether or not somebody would be wise for you to st study with them. And then lastly, the thing that I'll share on this topic is um, anybody who's sharing the original teachings of the Buddha and they're talking about getting to enlightenment, they should be well versed in the original words of the Buddha, that they should have them very readily accessible, that they should know the original teachings. Because 
a lot of places they might be talking about Buddhism or what they're doing might be labeled as Buddhism, but they're not actually sharing the original words of the Buddha. Even the Buddha himself talks about how you wouldn't be able to get to enlightenment if you didn't learn the true teachings that he actually shared. So the original teachings of the Buddha are in what's called the Pali Canon. This is 45 collections of books, 45 volumes of books, and this one collection of teachings. And a person who's uh, well-versed in the teachings of the Buddha, uh, they would be able to then share those teachings. So you would like to see that any potential teacher that you're going to study with is well-versed in the original teachings of the Buddha. Nowadays, we have them in English, but they're referred to as the Pali Canon. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're welcome. I thought you had a follow-up question. No, no follow-up question? You have more questions? You can ask more questions if you like. How about that? Um, you follow a teacher and mm -hmm. you trust the quality of the man as well, mm -hmm. but for some opinions that you don't agree mm -hmm. or you question the opinion. Sure. So the teachings of the Buddha, they aren't opinions, they aren't views. Uh, it's not a doctrine, it's not rules, it's not beliefs or anything like that. Instead, it's he's helping you to understand the world around you. He's helping you to understand the way the world is. So any teacher who's teaching, you should be able to learn those teachings intellectually. You should be able to examine them and investigate them. And then where you're having difficulties understanding them, you should be able to ask questions and get clarification. And if a teacher gets angry or frustrated or annoyed with you for asking questions, that's a good indication to go find another teacher because any teacher who is getting annoyed with their students for asking questions and they're not willing to help bring clarity to what it is that they're sharing, then it wouldn't be wise to learn from that person because in my opinion, a teacher uh, would really be enthused by students who are asking questions because they're showing that they're really interested in what it is that you're teaching and they're just needing help to get clarification. So you're gonna need to intellectually learn certain teachings but then you need to reflect on those teachings. Reflecting on those teachings is to independently verify them. So you'll see that anything that I teach you, uh, you'll be able to independently verify whether it's true or false. And I teach students how to do that. Like when I teach on Sunday, the very first teaching of the Buddha, I will teach it to you intellectually, but then I'm going to show you how to reflect on it so that you can independently verify that what I'm teaching you is true. And this is what you should be able to do with any teacher who's guiding you to get to enlightenment is you should be able to independently verify their teachings because they're the Buddhist teachings. They're not opinions or views. They're not concepts. They're not beliefs or doctrine or rules or things like this. He's explaining to you the way the world is. And now you can look at your own direct experiences in the world and you should be able to independently verify his teachings. So if you're learning from a teacher where you're not able to independently verify teachings and they are opinions opinions and views, then that's not what the Buddha actually taught. So you're not looking to agree with a teacher's opinions and views. Instead, what you should be learning is what the natural laws of existence are, and then you should be able to independently verify those and see the truth for yourself. So here, what I'm sharing with you, these aren't opinions, these aren't views, these are the teachings that will help you to be able to move your mind towards enlightenment and develop your meditation practice. And then I encourage you, don't believe what I share, but you learn it, you reflect on it to independently verify it, and then practice it and see the truth for yourself. So for example, one of the things I forgot to mention is about time, frequency, and schedule. That usually I teach students not to use an alarm during their meditation. This is a common thing that some students will use an alarm during their meditation, but I encourage people not to use an alarm. The reason why is because if you use an alarm, typically what you're doing is you're gonna be in meditation and you're gonna be thinking, is it time yet? 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 Your mind's gonna be craving, right? You're almost gonna be obsessively thinking about the time. Well, what you would like to do is eliminate your craving, desire, attachment. So if you're in meditation thinking, is it time yet? Is it time yet? Is it time yet? Your mind hasn't fully let go. Or the other thing that'll happen is you'll be deep in meditation, getting all kinds of benefit, and then the alarm's gonna go off. And it's like, oh, I could have got more benefit if I didn't set the alarm. But of course, sometimes you're gonna be on your way to work and you only have 20 minutes to meditate. So set your alarm if that's what you need to do. But in the evenings and on the weekends when you don't need an alarm, 
don't use an alarm. So if this is not an opinion or a view, it's something that I saw in my own practice and I know that it's true, but don't believe what I share. You know, reflect on it yourself, see your own direct experiences, and then practice it and see for yourself that when you don't use an alarm, you actually get more benefit out of the meditation. So if you see someone is sharing opinions and views, then it's not a, it shouldn't be a matter of you agreeing or disagreeing with their opinions and views. It should be a matter of you asking questions in order to clarify what this teaching is and then helping you to be able to independently verify it. So if a student raised their hand and said, David, can you help me understand how to independently verify that? I would then help you to learn how to independently verify anything that I share. So any teacher that's teaching the true teachings of the Buddha should be able to be more than willing to help you independently verify anything that they're teaching. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to help you to awaken to the wisdom to then be able to make wise decisions that leads to your enlightenment. Any other questions here or anything online you guys would like to ask questions about? No questions here? Okay. Let me see if we have any online. All right. I'm not seeing any online either. Okay. So then the last thing I'll share before we actually do some meditation together is remember the Buddha said, meditate monks, do not be complacent lest you regret it later. This is my instruction to you. What I would, add, what I would share with this is never give up right? This is essentially what the Buddha is saying is don't give up because giving up on your meditation practice is like saying, okay, I'm just going to be relegated to anger and sadness and frustration for the rest of my life. And I'm just going to accept the fact that I'm just always going to be angry and frustrated and agitated and annoyed and all these other discontent feelings. I'm here to share with you that experiencing those feelings is optional. While we oftentimes think in the unenlightened state that we're required to experience anger and sadness and frustration, and this is just the nature of the human condition, I'm here to share with you that you can completely eliminate and eradicate these feelings from the mind if you gain the wisdom of understanding how to accomplish that. If you give up on your meditation practice, it's like relegating yourself back to those feelings for the rest of this life. And if that's what you choose to do, that's your decision. And you know, that's a decision for you to make, but I would encourage you to to never give up because as you're making your way to enlightenment, sure, there's lots of enjoyment and lots of fun along the way, but there's some real struggles along the way too. There's some real challenges along the way. And it's important not to shrink back from those struggles because as you meet certain struggles in life, what the unenlightened mind will typically want to do is run away and, and get away from that struggle. But if you do that, you're just ensuring that that struggle is going to continue because you haven't cultivated the wisdom that you need to overcome overcome that obstacle or overcome that challenge. That's the only reason why the mind struggles in the unenlightened state and has difficulties is because it lacks wisdom. So if you have a certain struggle and you run away from that, you haven't cultivated any wisdom. So you're ensuring that this struggle is going to continue. It's going to happen again. So what I encourage you to do is turn around and walk towards the struggle and now cultivate wisdom to overcome that obstacle or overcome that struggle. And one of the things you might do is reach out to a teacher to get help. And that's how you can overcome your various struggles. The words of the Buddha on this is he says, do not shrink back from the struggle. This is what he shares. He says, do not shrink back from the struggle, because if you shrink back from the struggle, you haven't cultivated the wisdom and you're just going to ensure that that struggle continues. It's just going to happen over and over and over again. So if you're noticing the same exact challenges in your life happening over and over and over and over again, if you keep having broken relationships over and over and over again, if you keep having bitterness and hostility and anger over and over and over and over again, this is because your mind hasn't cultivated the wisdom that you need in order to overcome that. So if you shrink back from that, or if you run away from that, you'll never cultivate the wisdom you need. So giving up on your meditation practice would be to shrink back from the struggle. So you might experience different times in your life where you become complacent. The sooner that you can get rid of complacency, the better, because if you allow the mind to sit in complacency and dwell in complacency, it's a lot harder to get out of it. Whereas if you notice two, three, four days you haven't been meditating and you jump right back onto it and you're like, okay, let me get back into this, it'll be a lot easier to continue your practice forward. Whereas if you allow your mind to become complacent for three weeks, three months, one time I didn't meditate for three years, 
That was one of the worst three years that I ever experienced in my entire life. It was really hard to get back into meditation because I didn't understand these teachings the way I do now back then. So I went three years without meditating and I had a lot of struggles and a lot of difficulties during that time frame. So if you can catch the complacency really soon, then you can ensure that it's much easier easier to come out of that complacency. But if you allow it to be around for a long period of time, even three weeks or three months, it'll be a lot more challenging to get back into it. So if you develop your practice and just consistently build up your practice, this will be really helpful for you. And of course, you're going to miss a meditation here or there. You're not going to be able to meditate for three sessions a day for the rest of your life, every single day. It's just not possible. You're going to miss a session here or there. But the Enlightenment that you might experience in this life, it's not going to be determined on whether you miss meditation today or not. That's not what's going to determine whether you get to enlightenment. What's going to determine if you get to enlightenment or not is now that you've missed meditation today, what do you do next? If you miss meditation today, what do you do next? Do you allow that to be two or three or four or five days that you miss meditation or two or three or four or five years that you miss meditation? Or it's like, oh yeah, I missed meditation today. Let me get right back on that. Let me do that. Let me get back into my practice. So missing a meditation here or there is not a big deal. In a month's time frame, you know, you'd probably like to meditate 60 to 90 times, right? In one month. Well, if you miss three, four, five, six meditations out of your 60, no big deal. You meditated for 55 times during the month or 56 times during the month. So if you're missing a meditation here or there, no big deal. Just don't allow your mind to become complacent and it comes to be one day, five days, five weeks, five months that you haven't meditated. Okay. So I would encourage you to never give up on your meditation practice. Okay, so if you guys would like to join for meditation, I'm going to now guide you in a meditation session. Uh, you're welcome to use seated, lying, or standing position. Uh, I haven't taught you walking position yet, at least in this particular program. I do teach it as part of our other courses and various retreats that I teach. But if you'd like to use the seated, lying, or standing, it's up to you. What I do for easing into meditation is I ease into meditation with some chanting. If you'd like to chant along, I see somebody handed out the daily chanting sheets. If you don't have one, if you'd like to chant, there's some chanting sheets over on the table over there. They're laminated sheets that have the original poly that we're going to be chanting, uh, easing into meditation. If you look at these chants, you see in the English translations, there's a lot of admiration and respect and gratitude for the Buddha in these chants. I don't suspect the Buddha actually created these chants himself. It was probably his students, either during his life or after his death, because a Buddha doesn't walk around teaching his students to chant things to him. He would have eliminated his ego, his arrogance. So he's not going to walk around and teach his students to chant these things to him. But if you learn from a teacher who didn't want anything from you and didn't expect anything from you and and helped you move from anger and sadness and frustration to this peace and calm, this serenity, this contentedness and joy, you'd probably have a lot of respect and admiration for that teacher too. So I suspect his students created these as, as a way to show his appreciation and gratitude and respect to him either during his life or after his death. During his lifetime, he used chanting as a way to help his students commit the teachings to memory because everything he taught was oral. So therefore, they needed something in order to remember the teachings. They didn't write the teachings down during his lifetime because the technology to write things down didn't exist in that region of the world yet. It existed in China, but it didn't exist in that region of the world. So they didn't write things down until after he died. So every two weeks, they would come together and they would chant his teachings word for word for word. And this is how they committed them to memory. So there isn't anything mystical or magical about these chants. This isn't a rite, a ritual, or a ceremony, or worship. This isn't prayer or anything like that. It's literally just to help ease the mind into meditation, getting more awareness of mind and more awareness of the breath. So you guys are welcome to join along in the chants as I ease into meditation. Then once we do the chants, I'm going to provide some guidance during the meditation itself. Then there'll be a period of time where it'll just be quiet and we'll be meditating together. All of us here and those of you guys online will just all be meditating together. Then we'll come out of the meditation with some more chanting. The exact same chants that we go into meditation with, we'll come out of the meditation with that as well. 
just to give you guys a little bit of guidance on the seated position, since I see most of you guys are in that position. If you're on the floor, usually students like to have some cushions under their rear. You can have as many as you like. Some people like to even put their legs off the mat if you like. This helps to get the hips up in the air. You like to just have your legs lightly crossed, whereas if they're real tight, it would impede the circulation. So you'd like to have your legs just lightly crossed so it allow the circulation to flow. And if you'd like to put your legs off the mat, it gets your hips up in the air and it lessens the angle at the hips, the knees, and the ankles. But how you choose to sit is totally up to you. There's not just one fixed way to sit. It's what's ever comfortable for you. And that's why if you're sitting in a chair, this is completely fine too. A lot of people like to meditate in a chair. If you like to put your feet flat on the floor or cross at the ankles or whatever you find comfortable, do whatever you find comfortable. The hands and the arms, the Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together and he put this into his lap. And if this is comfortable for you, you could use this. But again, it's not about everyone doing it exactly the same way because our bodies are all different. We're gonna find different things that are comfortable. So if you'd like to put your palms on your thighs or your knees or your palms up or just rest your hands comfortably in your lap, it's whatever's comfortable for you. So just find whatever's comfortable. If you like that right hand over the left with the thumbs together, wonderful, use that. But if not, just find something else. With the upper body, it's nice to have it nice and erect. By having your upper body erect, it keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. And this way you can actively train your mind in a dedicated, active, purposeful training session. So by having your upper body erect, it'll keep your mind attentive and alert during the meditation. It also helps because your sternum's up and your shoulders are back. So you can breathe in that nice and naturally through the nose and you can get a nice full breath into the lungs. So that will help you as well. Whereas if you were slouched, the mind would have a tendency to be dull or lethargic. But if you were real rigid, the mind would have a tendency to be overactive or uptight. So having the upper body erect keeps the mind in the middle where it can be attentive and alert during the meditation. So again, I'm going to ease us into meditation with the chanting. You guys are welcome to join along. And then I will be back with some guidance to help you in meditation. Arahant Savakato Mahakavata Ramo Damang Namasami Supati Pano Mahakavato Savaka Sanko Sankang Namami Napmurhasa Pakavato Arato Samasaputasa Napmurhasa Pakavato Arato Samasaputasa Napmurhasa Pakavato Arato Samasaputasa Itipisu Mahakawa Arahan Samasamoto we cha cha ra nang sam uno Sakato ro ka wi to 
Anu pero purisa Dhamma sati sata tawap manu sanang Oto pakawati Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable, in the upper body erect, just close the eyes and start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose. Experiencing the full breath. And then, when you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathing gradually through the nose, Developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Experiencing the full breath. Breathing in. in out breathing in and out with the breath well established Start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in. and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. 
No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in. And out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out.
to slowly make your way out of meditation. So this is breathing mindfulness meditation. This is a primary form of training that the Buddha used in addition to other things to move his mind to enlightenment. So this is a practice that you're going to need to build up slowly but surely to that two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. And there's probably certain things in your life that if you clear those things out, you'll probably have more space for your meditation because two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more probably sounds like a lot to most people. But if you look at your life, there's probably certain things that you could clear out that would make more space for something like meditation, something more beneficial. So if you're finding that you're searching social media for two, three, four, five hours a day or things like this, you might notice if you clear some of that stuff out that you'll have more time for for something like meditation. While you are meditating, if you notice that you had a lot of thoughts, this is very normal, particularly when you first start meditating. You might have had a bombardment of thoughts. If 20, 30, 50 times during your meditation, you had to cut off and let go, cut off and let go, cut off and let go. This is very common. Or the other thing that might have happened is you might have had a thought and you indulged in that thought for a period of time and then you realized after two or three minutes like oh yeah that's right i'm meditating what am i doing here let me bring my mind back this is very normal during meditation when you're first getting started so if you notice those kinds of things you're not bad at meditation you haven't done anything wrong it just shows you that your mind is untrained it's undisciplined that it's kind of like a wild animal it's kind of running around the forest kind of frolicking around the forest right so what you'd like to do is train your mind and discipline your mind so you can control it because when you're angry and sad and frustrated and bitter and harsh you don't have control over your mind in that situation 
situation. So you're looking to gain more and more control and more discipline of your mind. So if when your mind moves off the breath, if you notice that, that's really good. That's mindfulness. And if you were able to cut it off and let it go and bring the mind back to the breath, that's helpful, right? So you might need it to do that 20 times, 30 times, 50 times during your meditation. This is very normal, very common. So this is what's going to help you to get closer and closer to enlightenment because the unenlightened mind is holding on. It doesn't want to let go. The difference when your mind becomes enlightened and you're meditating is you're still going to have thoughts. The goal isn't to actually eliminate your thoughts. Sometimes people think with the guidance of the meditation, your goal is to eliminate your thoughts. That's not the actual goal. The goal is to notice them sooner and sooner and to be able to cut them off easier and easier. Even when you're enlightened, you're still going to have occasional thoughts in your meditation. But the difference is that you're going to have a thought. You'll notice it right away. You'll cut it off and let it go. And then the mind will be quiet. It'll be still for a period of time. But then you're going to have another thought. Even when you're enlightened, you're going to have thoughts. As long as you're alive, you're going to have thoughts. You need those thoughts. That's what's helping you in life is to have those thoughts. So your goal isn't to actually eliminate your thoughts. It's to be able to notice them sooner and sooner and be able to cut them off and let them go easier and easier. And then as you meditate for more and more periods of time and you accumulate the benefits of meditation, you'll notice more and more space between your thoughts and there'll be more quietness and more stillness in the mind. So you're working to quiet the mind or still the mind, but you're not working to eliminate your thoughts. That's not actually possible. As long as you're alive, you're going to have thoughts. Okay. So any questions on building up a meditation practice? You can ask those here with the mics. Yeah, feel free to help yourself. Or those of you guys online, you can put those into the comment section of Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. What about mm, yawning, deeply yawning during meditation, that which cuts the rhythm of meditating? It, occur, it, it happens to me. Yeah, you're yawning like, oh, yeah. Yeah, this is normal. This can happen. Uh, it, you know, your meditation is impermanent. Everything around you is impermanent. So it's not like you're going to be able to strike the pose and then you're going to be able to fixate on the breath and you're going to keep your mind there the entire time. It's just not possible. So if you have that, like, I talked about like an itch or you're talking about yawning or any of these kinds of things, Go ahead and yawn if that's what you need to do, and then just bring your mind right back to the breath. This is really good because if 20, 30, 50 times you had to let go, 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 let go. Now in daily life, when something's arising and you're seeing the anger and the frustration, you can let go. But it's going to take you time to accumulate the ability to do that. It's not going to be one week or one month and you're enlightened. Uh, it's not even going to be one year and you're enlightened. The Buddha took six years to get to enlightenment. So it's going to take you some time. But you gradually build up your practice this way and you're going to notice these kind of things that are occurring. And if this occurs, then you just train your mind to let go. You're not even interested in being attached to meditation. Right? If you're attached to meditation, you'll get angry or frustrated when you can't meditate or you'll be outside and you're trying to hurry up and get home to meditate. This is like craving desire attachment to hurry up and get home and meditate. So you're not even interested in being attached to meditation. There's no such thing as a as a wholesome attachment or a wholesome desire. This longing and yearning that we're talking about, that's what a desire is. Oftentimes in the NLA state, we talk about wants. We say, Mom, I want you to come visit me. Right. What a want is, is a craving, desire, a longing, a yearning. And if you get what you want, you'll get pleasant feelings. You'll get happy. You'll get excited. You'll get elated. But if you don't get what you want, you'll get sad. You'll get frustrated. You'll get irritated. So if you said to your mom, like, mom, I want you to come visit me. And your mom says, OK, I'll come visit you. You'll probably get really happy. But if she's like, no, I can't come. I'm busy. You'll probably get sad or frustrated because of that want, that longing, that yearning. So instead, you might think, Mom, I would like you to come visit. I would like to invite you to come visit. And if she says, sure, I'll come visit. You'll say, okay, great. it would be wonderful to see you this weekend. But if she says, no, sorry, I can't come. Okay, no worries, Mom. Whenever you're available, you're welcome to come visit. 
right? Now you can maintain your contentedness or your joy. But if you have craving, desire, attachment, even for something like meditation, you'll get frustrated and agitated or annoyed when you're not getting what you want. So don't put the expectation on yourself that you'll strike a pose, you'll get your mind on your breath, and you're just going to stay with that a whole time because that's not uh, realistic, that the mind's not going to be able to do that. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Do you was uh, to talking about the um, ego and the bad emotion like that before, mm -hmm. and you said that uh, it's possible to eliminate it, that. Mm -hmm. What do you mean with eliminating the ego, for example? Okay, so eliminating the ego or dissolving the ego is to eliminate the what we call conceit. This is one of the fetters or one of the pollutions that is what we refer to as the ego. Um, there's also another fetter, another pollution called personal existence view. So during the lifetime of the Buddha, he describes these 10 fetters or these 10 pollutions. And the word ego didn't exist during the lifetime of the Buddha. So he describes what we refer to as the ego as these two different things. Essentially what the ego is, is it's this arrogance, this pride, this boastfulness, this measuring and comparing other people, like judging other people and putting yourself above them or putting yourself below them. It's like the unenlightened mind wants to have a pecking order and the unenlightened mind wants to know, am I at the top of this pecking order? Am I in the middle of this pecking order? Am I at the bottom of this pecking order? And the mind's constantly trying to figure out who's above me and who's below me. And this is from the ego. This is the arrogance, the pride, the boastfulness, the measuring and comparing. And that's going to hinder you from being able to get to enlightenment because people who you feel that, that you're above them and they're below you, <clears throat> you'll talk down to them in degrading and disparaging ways. But then there's going to be other people that you feel are above you maybe like a boss or some celebrity or political person and you'll be very shaken up when you're around them very skittish and very scared and by the time you get to enlightenment you don't have any fear in your mind not even the fear of death you won't fear anything at all <clears throat> so as long as your mind has this conceit you're not going to be able to have harmonious relationships because you'll be talking with arrogance and pride and boastfulness and when you talk that way in front of other people they're going to reject you because they don't like to be around somebody who thinks that you're above them, right? And you're talking down to them. So you're going to be rejected by people around you. You're not going to be able to live harmoniously with all beings. So when you dissolve the ego, meaning you eliminate this arrogance and pride, this boastfulness out of the mind, then your intentions, your speech and actions can be emanate from this humbleness where you can be humble. That would be the opposite of ego is being humble. And now when you're humble, you can just view everybody as equal. Like we're all equal. There's nobody above others. There's nobody below others. We're just all equal. And now if you're around any particular person, you can be humble. So whether you're meeting the president of your country or you're talking with somebody out on the street who's sweeping the street, you talk to them exactly the same because your politeness, kindness, friendliness, and respect is the same for all these people. Whereas if you talk to your president of your country one way and you talk to the street sweeper another way, your mind's having to constantly switch back and forth. And if you're in mixed company, like in a social event, you're having to constantly figure out who's above me and who's below me. And I talk to these people one way and I talk to these people another way. Well, what you would like to get to is where your mind doesn't have to constantly switch back and forth like that. And you're just always polite, kind, friendly, respectful with everybody that you encounter. And this is going to help you to get to that peace and joy because your mind isn't having to obsessively figure out who's above me and who's below me because that's exhausting for the mind to do that. So dissolving the ego would be to first understand what the ego is in more detail and then understand the tools and techniques to eliminate it. So in the first book, volume one, chapter 16, this is where we're going to go into the details of what the ego is and how to actually eliminate it with certain proactive techniques to be able to actively eliminate the ego. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, let me check here. How's the temperature here for you guys? Anybody cold? You guys are fine? Okay. I had the air conditioning clean last week and it's blowing really cool on me. So I've been feeling kind of cool the last few classes, but everyone's saying, no, we feel great. You know, so uh, 
I, I guess that that you guys are feeling great. So that that's good to know because it feels pretty cool for me. It's on 26. Normally it's on 18 and it feels just fine. But now it's on 26 and it's really quite cool because it's working so well. But thank you for that feedback. So I'm not seeing any uh, I'm not seeing any questions online from anybody. So what I'm going to do then is I'm just going to end class here by thanking all of you guys for joining. Thank you for your dedication and diligence to learning the teachings of the Buddha. And at the same time, I'll invite you guys to attend any of our future classes that if you'd like to come on Sunday or Wednesdays, these are great days to be able to come because we're teaching the foundational teachings of what it takes to get to enlightenment. And this is a seven month program where we use the first book of the book series and you can get this book online for free. You can download it at no cost. You can take it and go print it if you like. You can get printed versions here at the temple by just reimbursing us for our printing cost. Or you can order it on Amazon if you have access to Amazon. And if you read the book and you're coming to classes, you'll gradually build up your practice. And then we have various courses and retreats at different times of the year. You can see those on our website. You can see them on the bulletin board here where we have different foundational programs. We have harmony and relationships. We have experiencing the jhanas and the four stages of enlightenment. We have various courses and retreats retreats throughout the month and throughout the year that you're welcome to attend here but we also live stream these and you can come in by zoom as well because we have a bunch of people joining us here online so you guys are always welcome to join us either in person or online so as you need help feel free to reach out you're always welcome to uh, come ask me for help and I'm here to help you guys and support you in your journey to enlightenment so thank you all for coming and perhaps we'll see you guys in a future class have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day Sawadee Again for watching enjoy your meditation look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have thank you so much